Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for iPad Today is provided by CashFly at C-A-C-H-E-F-L-Y dot com. Coming up on this episode of iPad Today, Mr. Frog Pants himself, Scott Johnson, joins me. We're going to throw a bunch of apps in the cauldron, heat it up, and give you some witch's brew. <laughs> Plus, it's happening again. Apple's next announcement is right around the corner. Plus, the tablet space is heating up. Do we even need another iPad? All that and more on iPad Today. iPad Today is brought to you by GoToMeeting with HD Faces from Citrix, the powerfully simple way to meet and collaborate with colleagues and clients anywhere. You can share the same screen and see each other face-to-face -face with HD video conferencing, even from an iPad. Sign up for your 30-day free trial today. Visit GoToMeeting.com, click the Try It Free button, and use the promo code iPad. And by Ford, featuring available Sync. Now you can control your media player with simple voice commands. Enjoy your drive while you easily search and listen to your favorite songs. Check it out on the 2012 Ford Focus and at Ford.com slash technology. And by the all-new Slingbox, which could turn your mobile device into a television. With the new Slingbox, you can watch high-def TV on your smartphone, laptop, or tablet anywhere there's an internet connection. Check it out at slingbox.com slash Hey, everybody. Welcome to another episode of iPad Today. Things are different. Things are different. Leah was not here, but guess who is? You know him. Hey. You love him. He's a regular <laughs> on the Twit Network, Scott Johnson. Hey, hey Sarah. Thanks for having me back. I We haven't done this in a little while. I'm, I'm stoked to talk about, you know, iPads, one of my favorite devices of all time, and this new thing we're going to get on the 23rd, maybe. I'm yeah. stoked to be here. Thanks a lot. Well, yeah, thanks for being here. Thanks for agreeing to be on the show after last time. It was actually really fun, and it was a long time ago because I remember it was back in the cottage, which is mm -hmm. a good, I mean, probably a year and a half ago now. And for anybody who's not familiar with Scott, who goes, who is this character? You do an app show about this exact stuff, App Slappy. I, yeah, I do on the uh, the uh, Frog Pants Network. And many Twit listeners and viewers will know Eileen Rivera. And she's also on that show. We have a great time talking about apps. It's all about iOS. So it's iPhones, it's iPads, it's whatever. And a uh, spirited conversation yesterday about potential new iPad minis, as well as kind of the, the ongoing eternal war between Android fans and iOS fans and had a really good time. So yeah, it's definitely a show people should check out if you're if you're really into the iOS world. Well, that's why you are a perfect guest host for me today. So thanks again for being on the show. And we will as well talk about the rumored iPad mini. We don't even really know if that's exactly what the announcement is going to be about. But hey, if the leaks are true and they seem to be a lot more these days, it's probably where we're going with this. But we always try to start off the top of the show with a collection of apps and try to give them a little bit of a theme. Scott, you and I <laughs> both picked a couple of apps this week. I guess you could loosely say that they're all games of some kind, but they really yes. are a, a mishmash. Um, so I just decided to call them the Super Scott Johnson Stew of Apps, uh, which is what the whole Witch's Brew thing is about uh, at the top of the show, if that's cool with you. I'm completely cool with that. And can I just say, <laughs> props for that witch impression at the beginning of the show. That was that was pretty impressive. It shook me to the core, to be honest. You know, when I was in fifth grade, that's just the only tangent I'm going to go on on the show, hopefully. Uh, <laughs> I really wanted to be the Wicked Witch in our school play. And my teacher at the time was like, ah, you know, I think you want to be the Cowardly Lion because he has more lions. Mm. And I ended up finally agreeing to do that. And I was very good. But mm. I had practiced for uh, quite a while, um, having watched the, the Wizard of Oz many times as a kid, uh, to be the witch because I was going to audition for that part. So thank you for letting mm. me know I've still got it. <laughs> you do. It's right. And, and I can't wait to see what you do next with that. It'll be awesome. <laughs> It's going to be great. Yeah. <laughs> the witches laugh. It'll take me far. I'm just, I haven't figured out how to apply myself yet. So the first app that I wanted to talk about, Scott, this seems just so up your alley, at least something that it would give you a chuckle. 
This is actually a, a game that Adult Swim made uh, for the iPad called Girls Like Robots. Mm, you know what? I got to say about that real fast. For, oh, intro time. Sorry. No, it's uh, cool. The, it's, that was kind of loud. The, uh, the guys at Adult Swim, I don't know what they're doing, but they are making some of the most fun, ridiculous apps on the App Store. And it's so weird to get that out of. Normally you see like MTV Games or... CBS Interactive or you see things like that and you just kind of go, oh, we're not going to get like a true game here. We're going to get weird advertising nestled into a, a, a dumb game mechanic or something. And those guys, every game they've put out is totally weird and really fun and super addicting. So I, I put huge props to those guys. Yeah, this is kind of, you know, at first I was like, all right, well, what's, what's the deal here? Because um, anybody who has seen Leo's and my uh, games roundups in the past knows that I'm, I'm much more sort of like a puzzle game person and not so much first-person shooter and that sort of thing. But the funny thing about this, and yeah, I've already gone past um, the... Uh, I, I've already gone on past a lot of the, I don't know, where it sort of tells you how you know the game is supposed to be played. But the whole thing is that girls want to be close to robots and they don't want to be close to nerds. And you even have these like little nerd boxy-faced men who the girls are trying to get away from. And it's kind of sad, actually, but the whole idea is that you want each girl to enjoy the robot, but you don't want too many girls around a robot because then the robot gets overwhelmed. Great. So it's just as weird as everything else they make. Totally. It's totally yeah. weird. So I squeaked by on that one. That one wasn't actually very hard. And then I get a little bag of happy, which is, you know, my points. Aww. And then, so then, it, but the, th okay, this is, the, you think like, well, that's like the easiest game in the world, but it gets weird and a lot harder. So every, I'm not even really on a new level, but now if I get a nerd next, okay, nerds don't want to be next to nerds, uh, but they do like to be on the edge. So it's like, okay, now I got to think about that. So girls, uh, ah. <laughs> <laughs> see, she doesn't like them. <laughs> <laughs> well, so I didn't really do that well. I did okay. So I could go ahead and retry it, or I could go uh, to the next level. And they keep introducing just these, like, strange rules <laughs> about everything. I don't know. I don't know what to think about this, but I like the whole um, idea of putting stuff in place. I mean, this is basically like a game of, it's kind of like a game of memory or something. You yeah, know, I just have yeah. to remember what the rules are um, in order to... Oh. I get it. That, ner that nerd stereotype is pretty fantastic, I have to I have to admit. Well, I'm glad that you like it rather than think that, you know, <laughs> it's somehow offensive that girls wouldn't want to be close to nerds because obviously anybody who watches Twit knows that that's not always true or those are the no. girls that you wouldn't want to be near anyway. Yeah, I mean, I can kind of confirm. And I think anyone out, here, out there who's spent any considerable time in either junior high or high school will remember that, yeah, girls didn't necessarily go out of their way to sit by the nerd kids. I'm okay with that. I'm all right to accept that for what it was because now those nerds are millionaires and who cares? Now it doesn't matter. But back then it was kind of, a, that was kind of the way. So this is just a throwback to, you know, a different time, a different place. I don't think this is going to encourage nerds to, uh, you know, or girls to avoid nerds today. Like it's a very different outlook. So it's nice. I like the very, it's very tic-tac-toe, isn't it? It's just fun. I don't know. I mean, it's just a weird, I don't, I, I mean, this is it, guys. Again, it gets sort of stranger as you, as you move along and, and it does get more difficult and you have to remember all the rules of like, oh, wait, the girl doesn't want to be next to the nerd and she loves the robots, but a robot doesn't want four girls around him because then he gets overwhelmed and upset. And uh, it's just, this is, this is fun. It's 99 cents, so this is not a free game. But I think it's already worth a dollar just to kind of go like, oh, girls are nerds. Girls like mm. robots. Isn't that cute? So I'm yeah. into it. I thought you'd get a kick out of it. That one's awesome. They should. If you're looking for another really good um, game that these guys have put out, the Adult Swim guys, uh, that condo one whose name escapes me. Uh, shoot. It's kind of puzzly too. But that you want to see a weird game that makes no freaking sense yet you can't put it down. <laughs> it's, it's that weird condo crash something something. I hope the chat room would correct, correct me, but. I could look it up, but it's really good. So that seems like a good one. I, for a buck, I could do a whole lot worse, Sarah. Yeah, that's what I'm thinking. Hey, so uh, one of the apps that you floated my way, um, which I had weird Wi-Fi issues in the studio, so I just got it downloaded, mm. and I'm almost going to be opening it for the first time, is called Rebuild. Mm. Rebuildgame.com. Well, 
Let me tell you about Rebuild. Right. Um, Rebuild, as they'll see in video there, you're just at the startup screen, and the music's about to get real weird here, uh, unless you've turned that off. Oh, I love the music. So that, very discordant. Yeah. Very creepy. So what it is, um, it is a, a zombie game. And we're all sick of zombie games in the traditional sense that I got to shoot zombies to survive. That's kind of getting a little bit old for some. Personally, I don't mind them. They can keep coming. I'm kind of a zombie head. But this particular game is very different than that. If you played a game like, probably a good example would be something like Civilization, which is, um, you know, for a lot of players is a, is a fairly complex, what they call a 4X uh, strategy game where you're trying to sort of conquer and take over new land and new space and hire new troops and have them do things for you. You can go to war, you can win through diplomacy or technology or science. Um, this game is very similar in some of those mechanics, but the entire goal is this. You start the game and you choose a name for yourself, a name for your city, and a couple of options that kind of dictate how hard or easy the game will be, how big or small the city will be. And then you start, and what you can see on that screen, you can see on my screen as well, this little patch of land in the city where you've got, you know, little homes and little buildings, hospitals, schools, police stations, uh, power plants, that sort of thing. And your job as a survivor of the zombie apocalypse is to start in that space and build your way out to eventually take over the rest of the map, take over the entire city. Um, there's a couple of ways to sort of win the game. One is to get to the town hall or the town, I guess, the uh, the capital of the city. Take that over, clean it, of, clean it and make it clear of zombies, salvage any of the goods that might be there, and you can basically win the game. They'll let you go after that and keep building out if you want, um, which is what I like to do. But the goals are simple. You're presented with various things that happen during a day. So I'm on day 20 of the current game I'm playing on right now. I've got plenty of food, plenty of housing. I've just uh, got a new farm on the land, so I'm, I'm farming that for food. And as you do this, you find other survivors. And they may recruit and come work for you, or they may not. Or some people may die while they're in your care, or they may run off for some other reason. There's a lot of story happening. Um, but when you hire them, you can say, all right, well, you're going to till this land to make us food. You tell this other guy, well, you're going to help rebuild this house over here so we can live in it. So he'll go do that. And he gains skill and sort of building skills. You're going to take these other three guys and you're going to assign them to go out to this hospital that's in unclaimed territory in the dark. And you need to clear that place of zombies and also check for survivors. So they're going to go do that. And that may take three days for them to do that. And there's some risk to their lives, of course. The more guys you send, the less risk there is. Very strategy oriented. It's very much a strategy game. I mean, I what can't I even figure out what I'm doing. Yeah, it takes it takes a little bit. I mean, early on, they hold your hand pretty good. They've got a pretty decent tutorial yeah. that kind of walks you through the basics. Um, and it is, honestly, my first impression of the game was this is a little daunting for the average player. It's also not very animated. One thing I would have liked more of is less of a static view of everything. Everything's very static. I mean, the art's nice, but it's, you know, nothing's really moving. And when you get attacked by zombies, it's a static screen that tells you how many zombies attacked, how many were killed. And whether so, or not you I mean, took it's any... not like a, it's, it's more, it's a strategy game, not a violent game. Absolutely. There is, I mean, the violence is implied, but you're not killing anybody. There's no visceral sort of action in it. Um, it is a strategy game where you are trying to take the city over. But what I found after, I don't know, my first 30 minutes in this thing is I couldn't put it down. It's been out for a while. So this is nothing new. The advantage uh, these days is the retina graphic upgrade is really sweet on the new iPad. Um, the uh, the music can get on your nerves after a while. You can turn that off real easy, real simply. Mm -hmm. um, but it's kind of cool, too. It's got this nice vibe to it. But you'll find yourself just forgetting what time it is and playing this thing in the wee hours of the night. And yeah. it's awesome. Harsh language was off by default, but I just turned yeah. it on. Yeah. Uh, I assume that you've you've turned on your harsh, harsh language as well. I have, too. I've played one game without it, one game with. The only difference is, and, you know, dudes will quit saying heck. Or flipping, and they'll replace them with the appropriate swears. I see. So it's, it's not really that much different than the core game. It's just, oh, well, now this one's rated R, the other one was PG-13 kind of thing. Yeah, I, I yeah. have to say, as somebody who, uh, you know, I, I, I like censored and uncensored versions of things, mm -hmm. and given mm -hmm. the choice, I appreciate the harsh language uh, option. Yeah, if you're, I mean, if, if you out there watching or listening are fans of The Walking Dead or, you know, various other, you know, uh, George Romero style zombie sort of apocalypse stories, post-apocalyptic movies, that sort of thing involving zombies. This is a really great game that kind of fits fits a space that's 
not really being uh, utilized very much. It's not hardcore, bloody action, and it's not, um, you know, simply just story. It's something in between, and um, I find it incredibly invigorating. And it's really cool because you get these really interesting things will happen. A guy came wandering through the city on his cart, and he handed out pamphlets to everybody, and he's got them all convinced of, an, of uh, the a coming of a new god or something, and he thinks he's the representative. Do you kick him out or let him stay? So you have these weird moral decisions. If you kick him out, a bunch of your followers are going to leave with him. If you let him stay, you're going to have all this weird dissent in there, and they're going to kind of usurp your power. So there's a lot of those kinds of choices, and those are really interesting and scattered throughout the game. Um, I think it's awesome. I've loved it since the day I got it. The the latest updates have really improved usability on the new iPad, and it's just awesome. So that's people should play this. Ninety nine cents as well for something yep. that's totally awesome. And by the way, uh, you know your description of it is very similar to some of the other descriptions I read um, as far as reviews go. Where people say, I don't know, it, did, it didn't look like much, or it looked almost like a little, you know. Uh, like it was going to be simple or a little cutesy, and it's nothing like that. You really have to no. get into the game and, and realize that there's a lot more to it. Yep, it's really neat. All right, the next game, if you even want to call it a game, uh, is It's the Great Pumpkin, Charlie Brown. I can't oh. help myself because that's one of my very favorites ever. This is actually... Uh, this is, it's in the App Store right now, it's featured, so I'm not unearthing anything that you wouldn't find very easily just by looking in the App Store yourself, but it's worth it. Now, some of you, if you're, I don't know, outside the U.S. or you're young enough, uh, might not even know what The Great Pumpkin is, but that was a, it's an annual movie. Uh, I don't really know where it originated. It originated on TV, didn't it, Scott? Yeah, I think it was it was TV. Yeah, I, it was, I know there. I know that thing is still. I mean, every year it gets played somewhere. Big... Yeah, you you can find the Great Pumpkin, and and then obviously the Christmas special. But the the Great Pumpkin is a Charlie Brown uh, Peanuts, the 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 cartoon, the comic strip, uh, their Halloween special. And anybody who grew up, I don't know, probably within. 20 years of me knows about uh, The Great Pumpkin, and it's a story about, oh gosh, I don't even really know what the moral of the story is. It's good to believe in what you really think is important, because even if everyone tells you you're crazy, maybe you're not, you know, believe in yourself type of thing. Anyway, this is um, an adorable uh, multimedia version, really, of this book. I mean, you could call it a book, but it's it's almost more like you're watching the cartoon. So this is just the homepage. Uh, all I can really do here is turn narration on and off. It's kind of nice. I kind of like this. Or turn the music on and off. The music is some of the best part. So if I just go ahead and open up the book, um, this is, it looks like, oh gosh, is this actually what the book's going to look like? This is like a, a bad scan of, you know, a newspaper. But this is actually just, just a title page. It's um, the Great Pumpkin, Charlie Brown. If you get into the book from Charles here. Written by Charles M. Schultz. Th so this Narrated by Peter Robbins. All right. The original voice of Charlie Okay, Brown. thank you. Thanks, Chad. <laughs> what I've done is this little, this little gal right here, she's not actually a Peanuts character. That is an avatar that I created for myself. Um, so I told her what I wanted her to wear and what color shoes I wanted her to have. This is a pumpkin that I decided to make. This is why It's the Great Pumpkin Charlie Brown is technically a game because there's a little bit of customization that goes on here. But so, so you got to make the girl look how you want it. It's in the style of Charles Schultz. That's pretty neat. Yeah, it's kind of cool. This is the pumpkin that I've been working on. Uh, it's not good, obviously, um, but it's <laughs> I've just started. Um, there's a lot more carving to do. So this is like this part of it is very OK. Well, kids would like this, right? This is something that I could share on Facebook. Not one of my friends on Facebook wants to see this. I'm I'm convinced of that. So I'm going to go ahead and not share that. But hey, depending on who's using the app, maybe that's something that would appeal to your friends or your aunt and uncle on Facebook pumpkin, type of thing. Charlie Brown. Now, let's go into the book so I can show you how cute the book actually is. Narrated by Peter Robbins, the original voice of Charlie Brown. I apparently have a really hard oh, time getting the book. It was a brisk autumn day. But what's but cool about it is that the narrator is actually the original it was voice. Halloween. Yeah, that's crazy. Of Charlie Brown. Charlie Brown. just finished raking a big pile of leaves. Hmm. You go through it. I mean, we're only going to see a little bit of this. George! There's Linus, and he's going to go jump on the leaves. And you've got kind of some like this is you know very much for kids. The interactive qualities of it. 
And then, of course, obviously they've isolated the voices from the original movie. But this is, for me, it's just adorable. This is the sort of thing where, well, you know, I, I'm not an aunt or anything. I'm not doing a lot of babysitting these days. But if I was, I would have so much fun introducing this to a little kid um, who didn't, who didn't know that Lucy always football. pulls out the football from under Charlie Brown every time, and it's so mean. And he always wants to think that finally she won't, <laughs> but she always does. Say, Charlie Brown, I've got a football. How about practicing a few plays, kids? Oh, and then she goes on to say it's a signed document, and you know how this ends. Now, of course, if you want to jump to a particular scene, this kind of works with, uh, the same way that it does in pretty much any interactive iPad book. Well, you can you can jump around. That's sort of the beauty of being an iPad app. There are lots um, of fun things to that, do. You know, uh, a kid will like. There I am. Yeah, I'm at Violet's party too. So that's kind of fun. I, I like the pop-up quality of this. Yeah, it's really adorable. It's I mean, it's it's uh, it's somewhere between yeah, sort of cut out characters and the original Charlie story Brown, and a book. Have to model for and this is fairly easy, as you can see. I mean, it's really me? just a matter of uh, dragging your finger across the screen to get from different places. So sure, here's Brown. the only thing the about the great model. pumpkin, Charlie Brown, is that it's $5. So I really <laughs> do think that, I know, um, this is, this is for me, $5 for a nostalgic little, I love the great pumpkin story is cool. But if you're not familiar with it, um, I don't know. I, I'm not sure that it's going to be five dollars uh, worth your while, Scott. I don't know. Do you? I mean, your kids are a little too old for this, but do you see a good reason to spend five bucks on this? Well, I, they are getting a little old. I think they'd still appreciate it though, because as little kids, we we watch this all the time. We were really into it when I grew up. It was a huge deal, and these were already pretty old um, when I was of any age to sort of appreciate it. And I remember the great pumpkin stuff kind of solidifying Charles Schultz as a huge influence for me. Um, I happened to live about 15 minutes from one of his daughters. And um, we talked uh, about this, about, uh, about, the, about the Great Pumpkin and the influence it had on people. And the thing that's really interesting about that particular property is that there weren't really too many things on TV or in film or whatever. I mean, there was stuff in film, I guess. But the focus on Halloween was rare. And especially a good kid-friendly, wholesome sort of approach to Halloween. That was just unheard of back then. Throw in that distinctive style, throw in that kind of deadpan child actor kind of quality it had, and then add on top of that the incredible choice to go with that sort of low-key jazz uh, soundtrack that they always use in the, in the Peanut stuff. It just made for an instant classic. And I think to this day, it's pretty awesome. So if I was a parent, I am a parent of three, but if my kids were, let's say, three through six or something, I think five bucks is totally worth the price of admission, especially because you're going to give them an interactive experience. It's less them just sitting there, um, you know, watching the thing, which they should still do. But now they can, you know, fiddle with this and have some interactivity. So I think it's awesome. A Five of, bucks is worth it. A lot of folks in chat are totally agreeing with you and saying, Sarah, what is wrong with you? I mean, if it was a DVD, it would be a lot more than $5. This is art. I think that they also appreciate Charles Schultz on a level that we do as well. Um, I actually grew up in, well, Sebastopol, which is not too far from Petaluma, but Charles Schultz, um, lived in Santa Rosa. We've got an ice skating rink dedicated to peanuts, and he's buried next to where I went to junior high. I mean, Charles Schultz is a pretty big deal in my neck of the woods, so sometimes I wonder if people care about peanuts at the level that I do. And, and uh, judging by the chat room, the answer is yes. So uh, that's good. I'm glad to hear it. Yeah. All right, finally, let's get to our last uh, Witches Brew app. This is a game called Dungeon Story. All right, now, if you know me at all, you'll know that I am a huge RPG fan. I like role-playing games. I like the persistent character progression. I like leveling up. I like getting new abilities and skills. It's a genre that I revel in. I think it's awesome. So um, I'm always on the hunt for something cool on iOS that mimics that, that, that system of play. And I found one uh, called Dungeon Story. Now, this is... Some people are going <laughs> to be frustrated with this game because it is very, very similar to another game whose name escapes me. But a very, very similar play system to this exists in another game that came well before it. It wasn't available on the iPad, though. And also, I think this is a more refined game experience, so I'm going to recommend it. Um, it's called Dungeon Story, and as you can see on your screen, i going to open mine up here. Now, uh, I want to make sure go that ahead. we've got the same Dungeon Story because... Yep, you got it. That, okay, all right. Just making That's sure. That's the one. Um, I've been is... playing them. 
this didn't seem very first person to me. It's not at all. Here's okay. the trick. Here's the trick with it. That what that what you're looking at there will probably mind you a little bit of like, oh, I don't know, um, oh. uh, you know, bejeweled or something. Yeah. It's That's essentially like a collection it. of icons. There's swords. There's hearts. There's spells. There's money. Uh, these all do different things. And as you can see, I'm an adventurer, and I'm currently fighting a skeleton. To kill him, I have to combine enough of an offensive thing on this screen to kill him and move on to the next boss or the next uh, uh, creature to kill. So to do that, I'll like drag one sword and keep moving until I collect as many swords in a row as I can. That provides 10 damage. I do it. I've killed the skeleton. Sweet. First guy's dead. I've leveled up to level one already. And it moves on to the next screen. Uh, this is the game. I mean, you are literally just you use hearts to refill your health. You collect coins to get money so you can buy, buy upgrades. You combine the ice and fire spells to create spells. And you combine swords to create just regular good old-fashioned damage. And every time you kill a thing, another thing comes. And it says new monster appears or a boss appears. Sometimes they have special abilities. They make the, uh, the icons all shake up like an earthquake and change, which is kind of frustrating. Some might heal themselves. Some might poison you. Um, but it's this balance between healing yourself, using your special abilities. You have a little thing at the bottom. You uh, and as you go, and as you as you start to to get better and better, the monsters get harder and harder. Eventually, you are going to die. That is a given in this game. And when you do, you get to keep everything you did, all your progress. But you go back to your hero screen, and then you can buy a bunch of upgrades. Like, well, I want a better sword damage, or I want better spell damage, or I want to live more. So give me extra life points, or whatever you want to spend your gold on, you can. Then you go back in and you do it again. New dungeons open up, new items open up, new spells and abilities open up, and you just kind of keep going from there. It's not, some people are like, oh, Puzzle Quest. No, it's not like Puzzle Quest. Very different kind of, uh, not only puzzle system, but a very different kind of progression. And there really are no graphical coolness happening here other than the icons are all right, but there's nothing, you know, you're not going to see any of these creatures. They're all represented by text and a life bar. Um, and so are you. You're never going to see yourself either. But they have nailed that one more round, one more round, just one more round. What time is it? 1 a.m.? Okay, just one more round. Oh, shoot, it's two. All right, just one more. They've got that down to a science. And I love games like that. I love games that can just keep drawing me in. It's also very easy to pick up and play real quick, get a couple of kills in and then leave it, um, which is always yes. perfect for a good portable game. Uh, yeah, I, I love it. This I'm is the it. sort of thing that I would play all night. I yeah. totally get and you, that. And you would, too. You'd be surprised how much time I've already burned on this stupid thing. And, you know, it's it's not even so much that that they that they're, you know, it's not that deep. It's uh, I played a lot of really deep RPGs. It's not really that deep. But how you get to where you get and how quickly you get there makes it a lot of fun. It is very quickly risk, reward, risk, reward. And you're getting that reward all the time. Um, it's awesome. People should totally play it. It's only a buck. So what do you got to lose? Universal, take it anywhere you want. I wish I had sync. That'd be nice. I'd love to iCloud this thing because I do play it on my iPhone here and there, and I'd love to be able to sync those two games. But as it stands, it is uh, an addicting little booger. And I think even people that like puzzle games and don't care for RPGs, they'd still enjoy it. Gosh. See, look at you. You're just going to keep going. You're going to play ah, this. Oh, I knew you're it. Defeated. I knew it. I could tell. <laughs> I could tell I shouldn't have picked the snowflake. It's real good, though. That is fun. That is yeah. really fun. I mean, if that's first-person shooter... <laughs> <laughs> then you'd be in. Then I'm in. Then you would be the biggest first-person shooter fan of all time. Ever, ever. True. This is a dollar, too, by the way. This is, no, I love this sort of thing because uh, it's, I don't know, it's geometrical. I just like that aspect of it, you know? There's mm -hmm. almost a little bit of, like, a word scramble kind of a thing. But, yeah. yes, you're actually, it is a strategy game because you are trying to defeat the monsters it's not just there's people there's people in time. there are people out there whose whose brains are just i mean our all of our brains are this way some to some extent but there's a certain rhythm and reward pattern that if a game can get into that and and match that whatever that magic thing is of timing and and reward it's the kind of thing you just absolutely love playing it's like why diablo is so uh, such a popular series it's why other games you know uh, Angry Birds is a good example of a game that just you are constantly getting to do the thing that's fun. Yeah. And you can do that so easy on iOS. You can just, you know, come up with a quick, I'm on the bus and I need to get home and I'm on a commute. So I need a quick, you know, time distractor. It's perfect for that platform. And this game is as good as any of those. Well, we've got Girls Like Robots. We've got Rebuild. It's the Great Pumpkin Charlie Brown and Dungeon Story all in a theme together. 
there's a game element to all of them, but I think uh, we were effective, um, and we definitely got a good app stew going uh, in this. We should actually make that a re reoccurring theme. I like that. App mm. stew, when they don't really seem like each other, but <laughs> it'll be delicious together. <laughs> Just throw them in there and give them some time. Um, a lot of uh, folks uh, were excited about one or more of these apps and are asking each other, what did she say again? Um, just a reminder that if you're ever following along, maybe you're listening to the show, you know, you're commuting or something, or for whatever reason, you're not in front of your iPad downloading apps right as we're talking about them, you know that they're all written down in our show notes on every episode, twit.tv slash IPT is where you can find all of our past shows. This is episode 120, so we have a lot more in the vault. Yeah, last week, Leo and I had a very good time. As you could see, that was uh, how we acted when the Giants won, right before the show, which is when we shot it last week. Gosh, that was, I mean, I don't even like looking at that. It's like we're a couple of insane people. Uh, but if you scroll down a little bit, Chad, all of the links to everything that we talked about, for the most part, uh, is in uh, the show. So you can't miss an app. Even if you're confused, you just go to our show page, and that's where you can get all of the information. And by the way, links to subscribe to the show. We're, we have an HD feed now. We have several feeds, um, HD feed and a large and a mobile uh, for video feed. We've got audio feeds as well. If you say, I love the show, don't need to see it or it doesn't work for me, we'd absolutely give you the audio feeds too. You can find us on iTunes. I mean, try to make it as easy as possible for you to watch the show if you do miss our live recording, which is 1 p.m. Pacific time on Thursdays, um, which is a lot closer to 1 p.m. Pacific time on the days that Leo isn't here. Um, so thanks again to, to Scott for joining in and being my co-host. Um, and mm. remember, if you've got app ideas of your own, we get a lot of ideas from you guys. In fact, uh, we're gonna get to those in our viewer feedback section a little bit later in the show. You can always email us at iPadToday at twit.tv. Okay, Scott, we're going to get into some of the iPad news of the week. Uh, there is quite a bit of it, so we'll get through what we can. But first, let's kick it over to Leo to tell us a little bit about Go to Meeting. Hey, Sarah, and your name here. Uh, <laughs> I'm recording this early, as you can tell, because I'm visiting Denver, Colorado for the fine Madonna concert. But I wanted to come back through the miracle of technology to tell you about Go to Meeting now with an iPad. You can attend meetings. Go to Meetings has always been the best uh, me online meeting software with, with great screen sharing, fast, easy to use. So it, and it has to be easy to use if you're going to have a client do it to see your sales presentation. It can't be complicated. You send them a link. They click the link. The software installs transparently, painlessly, easily. There, there, there's a, you get with the Go to Meeting software, you, you also get a free conference bridge, a phone bridge, but you also can do it over the Internet with VoIP. Uh, I mean, it's just fantastic. Mac or PC. Start a meeting on your desktop, but you can attend a meeting on almost anything. Mac, PC, iPhone, Android tablet. Uh, oh, and you got to try it on the iPad. It's iPad today. you got to try it on the iPad. Totally amazing. Um, User-friendly solutions. Meet with your team. Train, collaborate. And, and with the HD face, did I mention HD? I didn't think I mentioned HD faces. HD faces is awesome. It means you're going to see your client and they're going to see you and you're going to build rapport and it even works. The video conferencing even works on an iPad. So click the try it free button and try it right now. All you have to do is use our offer code iPad at gotomeeting.com. That's gotomeeting.com. Promo code iPad. And we have a winner. I'm very excited about this. You know, we were giving away an iPad. And I want to thank everyone who tweeted. Where in the world would you meet? Uh, and where would you like to meet with? And or who would you like to meet with? And why? If you had go to meeting on your brand new iPad. And we have a winner. So what we did is we took everybody who tweeted using the hashtag iPad today free. And uh, we did a random pick. And I'm pleased to announce, can I have a drum roll, please? The winner of the new iPad. I'm going to sign it. We're going to get it here. We're going to put some stuff on it. It's going to be really nice. Are you ready? Karsten. Not you, Karsten. Pierce. <laughs> I did that. That was mean. It was really mean of me. Karsten Pierce, congratulations. 
Karsten's tweet, I would love to be on the International Space Station meeting with Aristotle <laughs> via go to meeting. Now, we didn't pick it for the creativity, but that's that's pretty good. That's pretty good. Vexed developer on Twitter. Well done, Karsten. Congratulations. You're a winner. We're going to get your information from you. We're going to sign that iPad. Or you could say, don't. No, please don't. And I, and I, a lot of people in the chat room, I'm sorry you didn't win. Karsten Pierce. We're, we'll do this again. We have lots more iPads to give away. We'll do this one again. Karsten Pierce is our winner. Congratulations. Now, your iPad's going to have GoToMeeting on it. So I want you to join a meeting with GoToMeeting. And if you haven't tried it yet, visit GoToMeeting.com. Click the Try It Free button and use our offer code iPad. Thanks and congratulations to Karsten. Now back to you guys. <laughs> <laughs> That's so funny. Uh, just as we came back to the set, uh, the little monkey fell off of the uh, the stage behind me and and decided to scream. He's upset because he didn't get the iPad. Congratulations, Karsten Pierce. I don't know if you're in the chat. I don't think you are yet, but. Uh yeah, that's exciting. Uh, Scott, we had a, uh, as Leo was explaining, a little giveaway. Um, so uh, a lot of people were participating on Twitter. And um, we'll do one again eventually. So if you didn't win this time, there will be more iPads down the pipe. But this one's special because Leo's uh, signing it and, and loading some cool stuff on it. Okie dokie, let's get into the whole discussion about whether or not we're going to see an iPad mini. We're here about when we're going to see an iPad mini on next Tuesday's announcement. Yet another Apple announcement starts at 10 a.m. Pacific. Yeah, that's right. Mm -hmm. And uh, we don't know anything about it besides what rumors tell us and the fact that Apple said on their event, we've got a little more to show you. Now, little. Yeah. A little more, yeah. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. I mean, the, the, the obvious connection is it's because it's the iPad mini, so we've got a little more to show you. <laughs> but the rumors have gotten crazy, Scott. I mean, we've, we've heard, uh, obviously, it's going to be the iPad mini, but then they'll bundle that in with um, some upgraded Mac minis because that kind of works with a little more to show you. And then we're going to hear about uh, an updated... 13-inch MacBook Pro that has the Retina display. Right now, you can only get the Retina MacBook Pro in the 15-inch. That would be littler. So, I don't know. I mean, do you give credence to all the stuff that you keep hearing about? Well, I'm, I'm, my money, if I was a betting man, I would put money down on an iPad mini, or as I would like to call it, Sarah, from here on out, and I really hope this takes off and becomes the real name, I would like to call it iPad Junior. <laughs> um, so if we get an iPad Junior, like I'm hoping, um, I, that would not surprise me at all. I think that's got to be what this is. They've already done all they're going to do with iPods for the year. They've done all they're going to do with the iPhone 5. Really, all they have left is either Mac stuff, or the iPad, or something totally new. And I'm sure it's not something totally new because we would have had some rumors to that effect by now. Um, so my expectation is, is I think, firmly in the iPad uh, mini slash junior uh, department. If, if it does happen the way uh, it's supposed to, I've had a little bit of time here recently with a Nexus 7 7-inch uh, 7 tablet, and I've become convinced that while I don't love the OS, I am absolutely in love with the form factor. Um, if this truly is a seven inch iPad and if it's truly all these rumors, uh, you know, are going to point to this being fact, then I'm going to have to figure out where to get the money because I'm totally wanting one of these things. I can't so, freaking wait. Okay. So that, that was going to be my question to you. You already have an iPad. You I obviously do. enjoy iOS. This mm -hmm. is something that you spend a lot of time with and you, you play a lot of games and I yep. know that the iPad, you know, it's nice and big and, and it's fun to play games on the iPad. What do you want out of an iPad mini that makes you want both? Because I think well, some people are going to have a hard time understanding why they need both form factors. Well, and I don't, they don't necessarily need both. And I, I'm probably a special case in that I'm a sucker for anything Apple makes and I kind of have a hard time saying no. But to answer your question as pragmatically as I can, I also read a lot and I also uh, read a lot of comics on, uh, on my iPad. I like to do a lot of sort of media consumption on that thing in places that aren't necessarily the most comfortable places for the current iPad form factor, being that being a bed or a couch or somewhere where I'm chilling. I would love to have a smaller iPad that I can watch a quick movie on, an episode on Netflix, to whip up a comic real quick and read Comixology comics or read a little bit of a book or whatever without feeling like I'm holding a tablet that is too large for those kinds of functions. It is a little overkill, though. I don't think they're aiming at me. They're not aiming at people like me who want 
this because it's another one of these cool devices and oh my gosh, I can't wait to have it. I think they're aiming at people who maybe think the iPad is currently too big or are considering other, you know, less expensive options out there that are smaller. And uh, it's kind of a combination of things. That form factor is really, really nice. So for me, the big drive, I mean, there's a lot we don't know. Actually, we don't know anything yet. But when we do, when we do know some of this stuff, um, the important things for me are going to be cost. It needs to be, you know, relatively inexpensive compared to a full-blown iPad. It needs to have a retina display. If they don't do that, they are completely blowing it. That's a huge mistake if they don't include well, retina. Well, I mean, the rumor is that it wouldn't be retina, and that's how they uh -huh. can keep the cost down. Yeah, which is why I mentioned that. That makes me really nervous. But hopefully they have that. I'm not that concerned about connectivity stuff. I know a lot of people are like, if it doesn't have LTE, then what's the point? I think that if it was Wi-Fi only or Wi-Fi and, and an option for 3G, I think that's fine. Mm -hmm. Um, so, so yeah, to me, it's a, it's a price point combined with enough tech that it makes sense for me to even have both. If it doesn't have retina, there's no way I'm doing it. I don't think it just doesn't, you know, once you've gone retina, you really have a hard time going back. Oh yeah. And that would be, that'd be tough for me, but I'm, dude, whatever it is, I'm super stoked about it. And I'm, I'm glad it's as early as next week that we're going to find out. I'm also going to go out on a limb and say, just based on the invitation and how there's like paint splattered everywhere and they've got a little more to show us and they've got uh, if colorful iPods, that maybe we're going to see little iPad minis in the colors of the rainbow. Yeah, I wouldn't be surprised. I mean, when's the last time we really got a bunch of color? Well, I guess we did with the recent iPod Nano updates. Um, and the Nanos have always sort of gone color. But not really since the iPod minis, the old hard drive minis they used to have back in the day. Uh, have they broken from the typical black-white motif and gone in a direction of multiple colors? It makes perfect sense to me that you've got a black full-sized full iPad, you've got a white full-sized iPad, and now we're going to release these lower-cost models mm -hmm. where it isn't just the front bezel that has color. I'll bet the whole back, I bet they go with some kind of either uh, you know aluminum coating like the new iPhone or something they can color. Plastic, maybe. I don't know. Rubberized something. Who knows? I, I'll bet you cash money we end up with like six to eight color choices, which is a great move. I think that's really smart. I remember when the IMAX came out, I mean, whatever year that was, when the big colorful cube IMAX came out and every kid got one in their college dorm. I was not uh, a, a Mac user yet. I was still firmly in the Windows world and I was like, oh, God, so stupid. What a, what a joke. What a gimmick. And they mm -hmm. sold like hotcakes. Everybody wanted one. You know, the, the mm -hmm. color thing is, it is that gimmick, but it, it can be effective. And especially if you have a bunch of people saying, well, I have an iPad and yeah, I like Apple, but I mean, I don't need another iPad that's a little bit smaller. You know, you change it up enough. So it's like, but this is for reading and you can have it in yellow. Totally different. Well, um, the more, I mean, Apple's always prided themselves on, on giving us products. At least this has been their hope. And I think this has succeeded in some ways, but to give us products that match our lifestyle. And sometimes our lifestyle is picking colors that kind of go with our personality. So I would love, and this has got nothing to do with Halloween, but I've always loved this color combination. I would love a black bezel on the front, bright, hardcore orange on the back. That is totally a, that is an iPad I would buy. Um, and there are plenty of people I know that would buy a nice little yellow one. And I know a few girl uh, friends that are girls, not girlfriends, but you know what I mean. They would totally go pink or something. Uh -huh. So why, why not let people not only have this lifestyle device in their life, but let them kind of have a little bit of customization. I think it's good. Hey, sure. We, I, know, I know because they write us, there are a lot of people who watch the show that don't have iPads yet. And I hate to think that they're left out of all this stuff, but they, I mean, they're interested. They're absolutely interested. So I know that there are a lot of you who said, iPad mini is right up my alley, 200 bucks. Well, if we're lucky, something, yeah. something that's cheaper than the full-size iPad that does a lot of the same stuff and has its own distinct character would be a, a welcome addition. Speaking, 249 is my prediction, by the way. I would think totally, so? I think, I think entry level, whatever that is, if that's 16 gig or, you know, what, I don't know what the entry level uh, sort of specs are, but I'll bet you money they hit 249 as a sweet spot. 249. Yeah, that would have to be Wi-Fi only. 16, yeah, it would. But think about what lucky. that would do at the end of the year. Your kids begging you for a 3DS or a Vita or something, uh, or even an iPod Touch or something. And you're like, hmm, this new thing over here with the bigger screen, but not so big, is that same price. I feel like they could, they could undercut a lot of other, not necessarily competing products, but products where Apple has had a lot of success sort of inroading portable gaming and things. And if you've got a kid who's got a choice between you know, a new uh, 3DS or that, I think he goes the iPad almost every time, if you can hit that price point. 
Well, now, what about uh, the next competitor? We do spend a fair amount of time talking about iPad competitors on the show, even though this is very much an iPad-friendly show. We now know pricing for the upcoming Surface tablet from Microsoft, and it is very much in line uh, with the Apple iPad prices. In fact, uh, All Things D has a nice little, uh, a nice little column that shows the Surface versus the iPad, versus the Samsung Galaxy Note 10.1. You could say those are all, you know, they're, they're sort of the top dogs of their operating systems. We see the Microsoft Surface without the touch cover starts at $499. Same for the iPad, same for the Galaxy Note. iPad ends up uh, uh, competing with Microsoft Surface for a 64 gig version. Um, of course, the Galaxy Note never quite gets up that high because it stops at 32. But it's a nice little comparison chart, and I and I wonder, for people who are interested in specs, like, do, does it have an expansion slot? Does this tablet have an expansion slot? If I'm going to pay $599, the iPad doesn't, the Surface does. Okay, well, the Surface seems like more more my speed. I don't know. We, we've been doing a lot of speculation all week on Tech News Today, Scott, about the Surface and and how uh, some of the, uh, is it the lower or the high, it's the lower price model is apparently uh, sold out so the pre-orders are getting pushed out at least a couple of weeks, which seems to indicate that it's selling really well, but it's kind of hard to say because we're not exactly sure how much uh, Microsoft was prepared to ship. I, I, don't, I don't know what to make of this. Um, I, I think that competition is good. So it's not as if I say, mm, Microsoft Surface. I might not get one because mm. I just don't know if I could justify the cost because I don't do a show about Microsoft Surface tablets. Yeah. But but I but I'm excited. I'm excited to see how it sells. And I, I hope it sells well because I just feel like the more competition that Apple has in the space, and let's face it, it really hasn't had much up until this point. No, I mean the iPad no. is so, so dominant that it's that's a good thing. No, it's totally true. The the it's funny because my experience with this Nexus, been playing with this, doing a little thing for CNET, um, has been really interesting to get my hands really as, as deep into Android as I've ever gotten them. Um, and I, I mean, as many inroads as they've made on the Android platform into phones and handsets, uh, they just seem to sort of flounder, uh, different manufacturers seem to sort of flounder in the tablet space. For Microsoft to come to the table with a dedicated piece of hardware with this new OS on it, which by all accounts seems to be, I mean, Windows 8 aside, forgetting about the desktop, the, the tablet interface seems to be pretty strong. The Windows phone interface was already well-liked by a lot of people. So I feel like they have some momentum as they hit the ground running with this. Um, time will tell. Like you said, they haven't said how many they've made available for pre-order in the first place. So who knows, you know, if you made 10 available, then selling out is, seems like a big deal until you find out there were only 10. I'm sure there are more than that, but it would be it would be nice to see this particular space get shaken up a little bit. Apple doesn't have a lot of fire right behind them uh, in terms of competition in the tablet space like they do with phones. Uh, so in my opinion, whether you like this new Microsoft tablet or not, or you really want to stick with iOS, this is good for both companies. It will fire things up at Apple, keep them strong and keep them nimble and competing. Uh, and it will, you know, give Microsoft fans a chance to, to root for something new and cool. I do think it's interesting that keyboard that that thing ships with, uh, the cover, is um, $100 worth of that device's cost. Um, I assume people can buy that separately probably for the same amount. It's it's actually 120 if you buy it separately. Oh, uh, okay. That makes sense. So, it's I mean, it's definitely an incentive to bundle it. And, I mean, keep in mind, like, this $69 leather smart cover that I have for my iPad... I mean, it's very nice, but that was a hard purchase. That's already 70 bucks right there, and I don't have a keyboard. Yeah. So I mean, the one some of the chat room just asked, wouldn't the Galaxy Note be, at a 10.1, be better for an artist like me where I do a lot of illustration work and stuff? Um, the answer is, so far, no tablet has been able to equal what I can do on a Wacom tablet that's connected to a PC or a Mac. Um, so those those kinds of things, we're still a ways off. The way the, the kinds of screens these use outside of the Note, uh, capacitive screens are, are terrible for drawing because there's no pressure sensitivity. With the Note, yes, there is, but there are a lot of other issues with that. So I don't feel like that space is under any kind of threat right now. Um, for me, resolution is a big deal, and the Retina screen on the iPad is a big deal, and neither of these other two comparative resolutions are up, up there yet. So that's a that's a big notch in, in iPad's uh, uh, corner. I don't know how long they get to hold on to that feature, though, and, and call it exclusive. You know, there's, these guys are going to catch up, and before you know it, you'll have all sorts of tablet opportunities that 
that are, you know, that are read in a resolution or higher. So not the biggest selling point down the road, but right now it's still kind of, that's that's still very interesting to me. Uh, yeah, I, I agree with you. And, and we've all got our little gripes with iOS. I mean, iOS in general, I've got an iPhone, I've got an iPad. They don't work exactly the same way. In some cases, they work exactly the same way. But there are little things about iOS where I go, I wish it was just a little bit different. And if something works really well on the Surface tablet, we're all going to start hearing about it. And it's going to push Apple to make changes that might not be that difficult to do or might be difficult to do, but it's like they never really had the opportunity to see it working well on someone else's tablet that people like better. Mm -hmm. So, uh, Scott, apparently apps are just blowing up in size. They're getting more and more bloated. A, a study from ABI Research uh, shows that the average size of an iOS app increased by 16% from March to September, meaning the you know, megabytes that, that an app um, is going to take up on your system. Uh, the average iPad app now 23 megabytes. Um, it, it probably uh, has a lot to do with the fact that apps have to be bigger in order to look better on the retina display. Um, mm -hmm. And the fact that uh, we have, uh, in some cases, quite a bit of storage. I mean, I've, I'm looking at my usage right now in my settings. And of my 64 gigs, I mean, I've, I've, I'm really just, I'm not even two thirds of the way through and I have like 400 apps on this machine. Uh, so I don't really feel like this is too much of an issue unless I get to the point where I have to start deleting apps. I mean, that's always annoying. I think uh, more of an issue for, for everyone I talk to is the media that you have stored on your iPad. You know, you can't have that many movies or else you're gonna have to start getting rid of stuff because there's only so much uh, storage that we can have on our devices. I don't know, what, what do you think about uh, the idea that apps are getting bigger in size? Well, it's <laughs> this is interesting because I remember the same conversation right around the time the iPhone uh, 4 released with the first Retina display. And what happened is everybody, all the developers were forced to, you know, if they want to support this new fancy screen, they have to upscale all of their assets. And when it comes to games in particular, they are, they are most affected. If you're talking about you know, vector-based uh, UI elements and vector-based elements of, of game, you know, content or whatever. That's no big deal. That's really just math and scaling doesn't really add to size. But for the most part, especially in games, once again, you have a lot of texture information, a lot of stuff that is, you know, bitmap or raster image based, which means to get those things up to where it needed to be, those had to be double, tripled, quadrupled in order to look good uh, on the retina display. So, that I remember this exact conversation about, oh, all these new apps, you know, all these apps are going up in average size to accommodate that. Um, but I think it kind of smoothed itself out. The bigger worry for me is the media thing, because there's also this desire on an iPad uh, with Retina that you want to see big high def films. And there are six gigabytes instead of the 700 gigabyte or 700 megabyte, you know, standard definition that you used to be able to watch on your old one. Now you're, you know, sort of getting that kind of media and that's blowing up. It's a little bit like when people quit listening to 96K uh, MP3 files and started bumping everything up to 128 and then 256 and now 320 variable bit rate and they're just bigger and bigger and bigger. And the devices seem to kind of keep up with that. Um, the, MacBook, uh, the MacBook Retina 15-inch Pro kind of has the same problem, but its problem is almost bigger because now you've got a <laughs> you've got a thing where you're looking at the web and all the graphical information created for the web for speed and storage, you know, efficiency is now ridiculously bad looking. Mm -hmm. And for, if that becomes a standard across, uh, you know, platforms and different computer manufacturers and Windows boxes and Linux boxes, and everybody starts getting displays that support that kind of stuff, then what you're going to end up with is a lot of really ugly web and now the web's going to have to up everything, which means higher bandwidth, which means higher caps for, or people are hitting their caps quicker because the header, instead of it being 50K, is now 350K in order to look good on a scaled up machine. So it kind of has this effect, right? And when we all start buying 4K TVs and then 8K TVs way down the road, but whenever, when that happens, we're going to have all these same sort of capacity needs. But I have a feeling the industry as it always seems to have done, it will just sort of move at the pace it's capable of moving. It's not going to jump so quick that we're all freaking out. So this little 16% bump, I think, is a very small uh, thing compared to what it what it could be down the road. I mean, who knows in 10 years what we're going to be doing and what capacity looks like and whether or not any of it's local and whether it's all on the cloud or not. But um, it is interesting to see 
the natural thing, which is I want my game or my product to look good on this thing. Apple's put out a display that I either I do it or I don't. Either I get on the ship or I jump off. So they're getting on the ship and making bigger stuff. And it's just, this is part of tech life, man. Yeah. Gaming apps, uh, as expected, um, are even bigger on an average. If you just you, uh, if you just look at the gaming uh, category, 60 megabytes on average, which is a six-month increase of 42%. But it's not just iOS. Android gaming apps nearly quadrupled in size to 40 megabytes on average as well. So, yeah, I mean, it's an, it's an industry thing, not so much an iOS thing. Yeah. Hey, you want to talk politics? Always, always <laughs> yeah, ready for too. politics. Favorite subject. Doesn't ever, ever <laughs> become polarizing to anybody. Uh, this actually isn't really about politics, but it is referencing uh, the second presidential debate. Happened a couple of nights ago, obviously, here in the U.S. Uh, we're coming up on an election. And Mitt Romney and Barack Obama had a town hall style uh, meeting where they answered a lot of questions. They did have Candy Crilly, who was their moderator, uh, who acted as a moderator. And one of the questions specifically, and I will read verbatim, uh, was... <clears throat> I'll be Candy Crowley for a second. Mr. President, we have a really short time for a quick discussion here. iPad, the Macs, the iPhones, they're all manufactured in China, and one of the major reasons is labor is so much cheaper. How do you convince a great American company to bring that manufacturing back here? Now, an article written by Eric Hesseldahl over at All Things D, it was, it was really great. Uh, he, he pretty much said... The president and the former governor both just botched their answers. Mitt Romney focused on the fact that, you know, China, we got to be afraid of China and, and he's going to go on the offensive about uh, what China is uh, doing wrong as far as why we should have any of our, the, our manufacturing there. And he said, you know, the president didn't, didn't, didn't say anything either because what he really should have said and that he kind of got going on that path but never really finished his thought is like, these aren't the sorts of jobs that we want to be creating in the U.S. economy where obviously job creation is a huge deal. What we want is to be creating uh, high-skill, uh, uh, high high-paid jobs, and these are not actually the jobs that most people would want. I mean, there's, these are extremely low-skill, very low-paying jobs. That's something that China has figured out how to do well. And that's never, it's never coming back. And he had sort of a great, hey, if time wasn't of the essence, and of course in debates, it always is. Here is my big long answer of what actually is the reason why we should never expect Apple to just move their manufacturing back into the US, even though of course they are a US company. I thought it was kind of a fascinating read. Scott, what, what, do, you, uh, what do you make of uh, the idea that Apple could just bring it all in house? Well, I, I don't. I don't know. This is, I mean, one of the problems with this entire notion, and I understand, it, this makes for a pretty fun thought experiment about how they could have expounded or what the real answer should have been. Um, but, you know, what you've got is a couple of candidates, the incumbent and the pretender to the crown who come in and they are this broad, basic understanding of so many issues because they have to. They've been coached on a million things. And I don't even see this as cynical. I just, it's just the way human beings are. How much information can you retain? Neither of them are going to be experts on how iPhones are made. It's just not going to happen. Unless there was some real impetus for them to do that, they're not going to come to the table and go, well, in Shenzhen, where we have a population of blah, 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 they're not going to do it. Like, I'll, you and I know more collectively than either of those two guys know about how iPhones, iPads, and stuff is made in China. Right. That being said, it is a very interesting idea that this notion that we are only to do high-skilled, high-paid jobs opens up all kinds of cans of worms. So if you're going to say that on either side, that high-paid, high high-skilled high means highly educated, highly skilled, which means good education when they're kids to f fair education for those who can't afford it to, you know, all these other political things, the balloons to start popping all around this question. Um, and I think that's really hard to answer. I think the idea that we can be that arrogant to say America's done with jobs we don't want to do. <laughs> We're right. only going to do those if we think we want to do. I think that's a little bit, a lot arrogant. Um, I'm not saying I'm ready to go sit on an assembly line and put one screw into 5,000 things today. I don't want. I don't want to do that. But I think this idea that we need to say, let the let the plebeians do our hard work now, is is kind of lousy. And I realize that sounds very political, and I'm I'm pretty centrist when it comes to this stuff. But um, it's a, it's a it's a it's a weird thing to bring up because a it's like well you can't really say you. 
bringing all those jobs here doesn't make a lot of sense anyway. A global economy is a thing we're in. We're in it. So we have to figure out what our place is in it. And our place is undetermined for the long haul, in my opinion. So anyway, I, I, I could go on for days, but that's kind of where I'm at with this thing. Yeah, I, I agree with you. I, I, I'm frankly sort of shocked that, uh, and it wasn't just about iPads. It was about Apple manufacturing in general. But the idea of iPads actually made it into the debate in, I mean, before they wrapped up. Uh, as, as a very good example of a, manufact a lot of manufacturing jobs that we would love to have here, or would we? So, yeah, we're not going to answer that question right now. We certainly don't have the answer, but wanted to bring it to everybody's attention. And again, uh, All Things D article on Eric Hesseldahl's uh, If He Could Have It His Way, What a Presidential Candidate Should Answer is really, really fascinating. That'll be in our show notes as well. Hey, so we've got some viewer feedback. I know a lot of you guys had written in, called in, sent us videos, all sorts of good stuff. We'll get to that in just a second. But first, let's kick it back over to Leo with a little bit about our sponsor, Ford. Oh, hi, Sarah. I'm sorry to interrupt. <laughs> I know I'm in Denver right now, but the magic of electronics are going to allow me to be here. And I know I've, I've rented a car, and I'm going to try really hard to get in the car a Ford and not just a Ford, I want Ford with sync. Um, I know you can get these in rental fleets, and it's awesome. I have, I've tried it myself, and I know people have told me. You get in the car, you pair your phone with it, it downloads your address book, the whole works, and now it's, I mean, it's your car. You've personalized the car. You can press the button on the steering wheel. Bling. Ah, the happy sync lady is there. Ah, it's so good to see you again. And you say, play Madonna. And it will play Madonna. You can play, say, I want to pl play Borderline. It'll play Borderline. You can say, play similar music. It'll play music just like that. It's so smart. And the idea really is very smart, too. Ford was figuring, how do we... I, we know people get in the car. They don't want to be disconnected from their devices. That's why they're always, you know, is this issue with distracted driving. How can we keep people with their eyes on the road, their hands on the wheel, paying attention to what they're doing, and still connect them? And that's where they invented Ford Sync. And I tell you, it's been a few years now. The voice recognition is the best in class. It works well with a variety of voices. <clears throat> and the things you can do, you can set the cabin temperature. Uh, you can play music. Of course, you can place calls. You can get directions all through your voice without taking your hands off the wheel or your eyes off the road. It does work with an iPhone 5, by the way. I'm happy to report. I tried it the other day with my lightning cable. No sweat. You can voice control music no matter how it's controlled on your smartphone via Bluetooth streaming on a USB drive. Yeah, you could plug it. You could plug a USB drive loaded with MP3s on there. It would index it, and you could search for them by name. It's a, it's really amazing on an MP3 player. The new iTunes tagging feature is kind of cool. It's on available sync with my Ford Touch and HD radio technology with iTunes tagging. What happens is you hear a song you like, you tag it. When you get home, you buy it on iTunes. It actually says, oh, this was the song, and you can just click and buy. Best of all, Ford offers sync on every 2012-2013 Ford vehicle sold in the U.S., including the 2012 Ford Focus, which is absolutely, well, <laughs> I wanted the electric Focus. Now I want to, I'm thinking the Ford Fusion, but that has it too. The Energy, the 2013, oh, plug-in hybrid, oh, sweet. Look, go test drive one at a Ford dealer near you. Go further in a Ford and don't forget, when you test drive it, bring your smartphone so you can test, test the uh, Ford Sync as well. Ford.com slash technology if you want to learn more. Thank you, Ford, for your support. And now back to you with iPad Today. Sarah Lane! Thanks, Leo. You're the best. It's hey. like he's here. It's <laughs> like he's right here right now. You know, we had this long discussion about whether we should have your avatar, Scott, over where Leo actually sits on the yeah. set. And then we thought, ah, we're overthinking it. And now I realize he should have been sitting there when he was reading. Yeah, it would just been in this uh, kind of thing. Sure. But how could we know? In hindsight, <laughs> I always have such good ideas. 2020. We, yeah, exactly. We got some uh, feedback. One one is uh, some feedback from our, our episode uh, 119, which uh, was last week. We had talked about some banking apps. And banking apps are always really hard to cover because if you're actually using the app and you've got a bunch of accounts connected, it's very difficult to show it off without releasing a lot of information, at least for me anyway. Leo doesn't have as much of a problem as I do. I'm just embarrassed because I don't have a whole lot of money. Anyway, one of the apps that we showed off was the USAA uh, iPad app. Now, uh, 
Uh, Christopher Anthony, who is a USAA member, wrote us and said, Leo mentioned that the USAA iOS app was an iPhone app that he was running on his iPad. That's not actually correct. It used to be just an iPhone-only app, but now they have had an iPad app for about a year, and I love using it to deposit my check. So thanks for the clarification. If anybody was put off uh, by the fact that this is an iPhone-only app, turns out, uh, that they they have uh, another option for you and we got a bunch of email um, as I expected uh, because on the show I had said I don't think I can become a USAA member even though my dad was a vet and Leo said ah, I think it's just for officers and I said I don't think he was one um, and a lot of folks who are active and uh, and veterans uh, said no 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 you can be a USAA member they have all sorts of features for anybody. There are just certain features for active military, veterans, uh, spouses, and uh, children of, of military. So it's true that it's not just for officers, but all accounts are not created equal. Um, so just something to keep in mind. I know a lot of you are familiar uh, with the, the bank's credit union, really. Um, Scott, do you use USAA or are you at least familiar with it? Uh, yeah, in fact, um, I'm. <laughs> it's a little embarrassing to admit, but my uh, my accountant slash wife uh, uses it constantly, and she is a pro at that thing. I don't. I hardly touch it, so I couldn't tell you the first thing about how to like get in there. All I know is uh, we had to do like a crazy array of like secret passwords and secret questions, but uh, which made me feel good actually. It's nice to have you know some security there. But yeah. she runs all that. I have no idea how it's going. That's actually a great way to be. <laughs> <laughs> I wish I could just be like, I, you know, somebody who's really smart with money is just handling my finances so I don't have to worry about it. Yeah, so I just wanted to make sure that we were aware uh, that, uh, that, that there are options for everybody. So just in case anybody was confused, wanted to make sure that we're all on the same page. Also got an email um, from, I don't have it in my notes who this was from. It, uh, how, you know what? It was from the company itself. That's why. This is a app, and Scott, I know that you're a big movie watcher, so I thought that you might actually enjoy this. Mm. Let me go ahead and open it up. It's called Hollywood Photo Booth. It's really nerdy, um, extremely nerdy, but you can put basically your face <laughs> and body with a extremely well-known, beloved character from a classic Hollywood movie. So if I were to go ahead and say, okie doke, um, let's go ahead and use front-facing camera. Um, and obviously, I'm way bigger than this, so I'd go ahead and... <laughs> if That's I want awesome. to be Charlie Chaplin, I can move the hat, you know, if I want it to be a little bit higher. And then, you know... Yes, fine. Now, <laughs> I can send it to all my friends. <laughs> yeah, Finally, Facebook thank Twitter. goodness. I mean, this is just the stupidest thing ever. Um, okay, I'm not going to do this right now, but I'll show you some of the other, fine, fine, fine. I'll show you some of the other options that you have. So let's go, um, let's get out a little bit. So these are, I couldn't figure out who this was. Um, I could look it up in the settings, but I don't know who this is. But this looks kind of, I don't know, Brokeback Mountain or... I don't know, I don't know who that is. Uh, you know what I think it is? I think that's the, what's his name? Who played yeah. the, uh, the Joker. That's now, him. this looks like Elizabeth. I would think. Yeah. Yeah? Yep. Yep. We got a... Now, I don't know what is this is. is that? What in the heck? Who is That's that? That's a movie, movie I have not seen. <laughs> Something from the 70s. <laughs> uh, I think we're looking at uh, Blues Brothers. Possibly. Are there, yeah. Yeah. Yes. I'm going to say that's... That's, what's his name? Uh, that's Dan Aykroyd's character. I'll bet you money. Yeah. And then this one is... Elwood, is it? I don't yeah, know. totally accurate. We got this guy. This is, I, I, it looks queen-like as well. Uh, yeah. I think this is Gladiator. Uh, totally Gladiator, Totally yeah. Gladiator. I mean, what guy doesn't want to be in a Gladiator outfit? I didn't None really like that too. movie so much, so I'm all Oh, good. I love that movie. Oh, it's so good. Now, obviously, I'm using the front-facing camera, so I'm having to, you know, make, make these costumes really big, and you're missing out on all the good stuff. You're probably better off just taking a photo of yourself back a little bit and then importing it later. Um, but yeah, this is good fun. You've got all I like sorts that. of choices I think that sounds here. like fun to me. Yeah. Oh, wait, no, this is Elizabeth. Or maybe there's two different Elizabeths. I don't know. 99 cents for this app. Hey, listen, 
if you're interested in <laughs> something really silly, now this is the sort of thing that, that definitely will give people a laugh, then uh, go ahead and download it. Again, it's called Hollywood Photo Booth, and it's a good time. Now, there, it, there aren't a endless amount of costumes. I uh, went through them earlier. I think there were like 30 or something. I mean, who's that? Now you gotta be, you gotta be like laying down. Yeah, what is, uh, uh, Dangerous Liaisons is what that is. Oh my gosh, good one. It just pulled out of my head like it a, sure it was almost did. violent. And we're back at Charlie Chaplin again. So, hey, yeah. whatever. Every once in a while, <laughs> a company sends me, we get a lot of pitches, right? From PR companies, of course, saying, look at our app. And a lot of them are great. Uh, we just can't get to all of them. And this sort of stood out at me as like a, let's see. No, Indi no Indiana cool. Jones in there? Uh, I, apparently not, no. No deal then, no deal. Not worth a dollar. Not in Scott Johnson's <laughs> book. You no. don't give me Indiana Jones, come on. All right, so we, got a, uh, we got a voicemail from Chris, who is a little miffed that iOS 6 is missing a very important feature. Hi, this is uh, Chris from New York. I'm a huge fan and love watching all your shows. Just wanted to bring up a missing feature in iOS 6 that I've used a lot. I'm quite upset that it's no longer there, which is being able to gift an app. This is a feature I use a lot for friends and family. Not sure why it was taken out or if it would be put back in the future update. Also wondering if the new iTunes will exclude this feature. What do you think? Thanks for the show. Keep up the great work, guys. So my first reaction to Chris, uh, his question, by the way, he was a little muffled, was uh, why can't you gift apps anymore from the App Store? My first reaction was, yeah, you can. That's not gone. But it is in yeah. iOS 6. You can still gift from iTunes on your computer. But if you've got something that requires a payment, I do not have the option to gift it. I have the option to copy the link and share it somewhere. I can email it. I can SMS it. I can send it to Twitter or Facebook, but that's it. And I that was there before. I know I know Chris yeah, is right. Something's weird. I mean, I can still I did not know this. And I was just thinking, well, maybe they buried it because sometimes features get moved around. But the share feature, which expanded, now includes mail, messages, Twitter, Facebook, or you can copy the link directly and put it in something else. But that and I thought, well, maybe they stuck it in there, but no, there's it's gone. I'm kind of blown away. Unless it's hidden somewhere I can't find. It's I don't see it either. You know, I looked around if it's hidden, it's hidden to the point where no one can find it. I mean, <laughs> unless you, the two of us are crazy, along with Chris. No, I think it's gone. And that makes very little sense to me. I mean, this is Apple making money off of somebody buying the app. Who cares if I'm gifting it to you or if I'm buying it for myself? It's the same amount of money. Why would they not want to make it as easy as possible to gift on the fly? Because a lot of times, I mean, I'm not... I do look at the App Store on my computer just because I'm on my computer quite a bit during the day, but it's it's not as if I prefer it over my iPad. I mean, in a perfect world, I would just I would just be on my iPad all the time, particularly in the App Store. So it doesn't make a whole lot of sense to me, and, and it does seem a little fishy, hmm. almost like yeah, a, like an oversight rather than actually a feature that they took away. And it very well may be one. Like, there's, they fixed so many, th I mean, some might argue they broke a few things, but for the most part, the iTunes uh, interface for getting apps and stuff uh, via the iPad has improved for me. Um, there's a lot more information, better information. I don't necessarily like how search results are handled, but whatever, I can get past that. I like updates. I don't need to password for updates. Things like that are nice. So all these new features, all these new bits, it's, I, it, it literally feels like they just forgot. Because why wouldn't you want to have a feature that just means more means more sales, means more money. And I have that happen all the time. I'm like, I really like this app. Maybe my friend Tom Merritt would like it too. I'm going to go gift it to him. And I can't do that anymore. You can do, you can do gift certificates, but I just want to give him this $1.99 app. And that doesn't seem to be there anymore. Yeah, it's very weird. Messing in iOS 6. Chris, thanks for letting us know. Maybe if we get angry enough, Apple will fix it. Um, and I'm surprised we haven't heard about it until now. So thanks for bringing it to our attention. Also got a tweet from Y Brammer. That's the letter Y, B-R-A-M-M-E-R, -M -M -E on Twitter, who pointed us to a very disappointing story. It's probably going to disappoint you, Scott, more than it disappoints me, but I know it's really going to disappoint Leo because mm. he was just talking two weeks ago about the fact that we heard about Infinity Blade Dungeons oh, in, yeah. what, March of this year when the, when the new iPad was released. We've been wondering where it's been. No one says anything, and now word comes through 
that it is delayed until 2013. Yeah, here's what I believe is going to happen. So Chair Entertainment, um, who's not directly working on this, is a different team, but they're local here, and we're huge fans of Chair. They're awesome. The, the Infinity Blade series is pretty cool, and they've done some really neat stuff. And when, when Apple drags those guys out on stage along with Epic Mega Games, and they rep hard for something like this as a selling point for a new piece of hardware... The expectation is usually, hey, within the next month or so, or even sooner, we're going to have that thing. And, and having that not come about is really disappointing. What's more disappointing to me is knowing that Apple's on a yearly release schedule with updates to the iPad. We're probably not going to see this game until whatever the next iPad is. Mm -hmm. So I, if we really hear about new iPads in March, which is totally likely at this point, then oh, what are they going to do then? Are they going to drag somebody out again? Are they going to drag them out again? I, when they say 2013, typically that doesn't, well, it's, this may be different than regular video game cycles, but that's usually somewhere between January and March when they say that. I just feel like it's, it was, it's just kind of a bummer because they had us all excited. It looked like a really fun action RPG, kind of in the vein of Diablo, which a lot of us are very hungry for then. Um, all of this aside, though, Sarah, I'm also a big proponent believer in if it isn't done, if you're not happy with it, if it isn't polished, take the time you need to make the game better. So if that's what they're doing, then I think I'm cool with that. But it's just, it's unfortunate that it was this big marketing ploy that we'll never get to see until they're done. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Especially since this is the reason that Infinity Blade works so well in an Apple announcement is because it's such a great way to show, look at the graphics, look at the, you know, the CPU power. Uh, the new iPad can handle this. It's going to look so awesome on a game like... Infinity Blade Dungeons. Mm -hmm. Now, they can't do that again at the next announcement because that just looks, it almost looks worse. Now yeah. it just has to has to uh, be released at some point, not on stage. I don't know. I, I'm, we're definitely going to, Leo's going to be playing a lot of this when it does come out. And I agree with you. You want a, you want a good game rather than a game that uh, comes out soon that's not done. Uh, but it just like makes everybody look kind of sloppy. You know, what, did Apple know that it was going to be delayed? Probably not, or they wouldn't have mm -hmm. made a big deal out of it. Mm -hmm. um, so that's the news. That's what we know so far. 2013, we don't know when, but hopefully sooner than later. All right, before we get to our AppCap Awards, want to just remind everybody you have a ton of ways that you can get a hold of us. You can write us at iPad Today at twit.tv. You can send us a voicemail at 757-504-IPAD. Thanks to everybody who sent voicemails this week. Try to keep them to 30 seconds or less. That's a kind of a sweet spot so that we can uh, have as many as possible in the show. Or for extra points, they're not real points. They're just admiration points. You can send us a video. Um, you don't actually get anything, but we really appreciate it. So hopefully that's enough can be a question a comment or anything like that just uh, upload it somewhere and send us the link okay scott we're gonna toss it over to leo to tell us a little bit about our third sponsor and during that time i want you to get your app cap on because when leo's done we're coming back and we're doing our app cap awards yeah i am so excited the new sling boxes have you seen the new sling boxes the new sling boxes here go to slingbox.com Slash twit. You can learn all about it. I've known about these for a little while, and I kind of had to hold back. The Slingbox 350 and the Slingbox 500. Now, we have heard us talk about the Slingbox. The whole idea of the Slingbox is you can watch your TV high def wherever you are anywhere. Smartphone, laptop, tablet, wherever you can get online, you can watch your home TV. The new Slingbox, built-in Wi-Fi. You don't have to worry. You can use it anywhere in the house. Hallelujah. That's fantastic news. HDMI connectivity. We're talking really high quality. 1080p full HD. So now with the new Slingbox and the Slingbox app on your iPad, let's say, you can watch live high-def TV anywhere there's an internet connection. You can even wirelessly archive your photos and videos from your iPad to your Slingbox and watch them when you get home. What? 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 I'm telling you, the new Slingbox is great. Watch and control your home DVR from anywhere. You're always watching your home TV system, so you don't have to pay any additional fees. I really like that. So here's how it works. Buy the new Slingbox. Hook it up to your TV. Hook it up to the Internet. Hit the road. Bring your iPad with you or your iPhone, and you can watch your favorite shows anywhere you go. Your backyard, your garage, restaurant. Even if your wife or girlfriend drags you to a Madonna concert, <clears throat> <laughs> you can still watch the ball game. I don't want to miss the ball game, but I'm not going to because I got my slingbox. 
the new Slingbox 500. Check it out at slingbox.com slash twit or Best Buy, Amazon, or Fry's. Love that new Slingbox. Back to iPad today. Thanks, Leo. Scott, put oh, your app hat. cap on. Sorry, hat. Jeez, what the heck? three minutes. Sorry, here we go. Come on. Now, that is a, <laughs> that is a nice cap. Now, All right, let me tell you about this. You want to know where I got this? I do. A fan, a fan, a listener of my World of Warcraft show, The Instance, uh, what people should be listening to if you're playing WoW, um, made this. Hand sewed it. Everything's like all hand done. That's it's an so orc. Cool. You can't really see it. It's an orc head. See? Yeah. His little face there and his little hair on the top. So uh, I am repping hard today. You, I love it. That's one yeah. of the best app caps I've ever seen. And I don't say that just to anybody. That is mm. nice. I did. Nice. We, we were we were listening to a little Dead Mouse before the show, so I did my best to give myself a little bit of a Dead Mouse hat. <laughs> it's really just a Disney hat, but hey, you know, just squint and I'll seem really cool and hip. You know, like one of those dead mice. Mm. But uh, I'll start. And this is my app cap. By the way, for anybody who's watching this show for the first time, this is the part of the show where we each pick an app that we love doesn't have to be in any sort of category and it doesn't even have to it has to be an app that that we love for whatever reason that we think you might love too and we wear hats while we talk about it that's just the app cap awards so i'll start and this is an app that i am a little bit embarrassed we haven't covered on the show uh before because it's not brand new it's relatively new though last couple months and that is dig Dig, as you may recall, uh, has been a company for a long time. However, went through an extreme change uh, when it was uh, sold to Betaworks, who pretty much stripped the whole thing down and made it an entirely different product. It's still yep. based on popular stories around the web, but it is a much simplified version. You don't have a lot of complicated categories. You can submit stories um, using uh, uh, Dig on the web. So there is still that crowdsourced, let's all decide what gets, uh, what rises to the top together. But it is a different product completely and no more commenting and it just, I like it. I actually, I'm actually pretty happy with the Dig product. The Dig app, which is of course is totally free, looks almost exactly like it will look if you go to dig.com on the web. Right now I am looking at top stories. This is stuff that's at the top of Dig. Um, there we've got sort of an environmental story. Uh, we've got uh, well, a story about Violent Acres here from Reddit. We've got a story about Google Revenue. I mean, this is hey, you know, this is a this is a pretty good rounded out collection of stories that I might find interesting. Okay, well, those are the top stories. This is the this is the front page of Dig, you know, in its in its new incarnation. If I go to popular stories here, these are stories uh, that are popular. You know, and gaining momentum, obviously. And what's interesting about this is, is that if I say, well, what about the popular stories in the tech section? There just is none of that anymore. So as long as you don't mind doing some really he heavy filtering on subject matter, this is actually, in my opinion, a more fun way to browse the news because this is all pretty popular stuff, but it's not necessarily stuff that I would already be reading in my Google Reader. Uh, for example, if I want to save a story, this is kind of cool. Let's say I want to save a story about why the snooze button is ruining my sleep. Um, go ahead and, you know, I could thumb, thumbs up if I liked it. I go ahead and bookmark it um, if I want to add it to my reading list. What's cool about that is that, okay, let's just go back to my main page. Now, in my saved area on the bottom, you see that same little bookmark. It is now in my reading list, but it is also now sent to Instapaper because I'll open up my settings. I have uh, connected this with Twitter, but also in my extra services area, if you click through there, I have connected it to my Instapaper account. Uh, and I have one, you can also connect it to Pocket. You can also connect it to Bitly if you're gonna be sharing links and you want that to be uh, associated with your Bitly account. So that's kind of neat. It's, um, it's very much a, hey, maybe you started reading this Dig article somewhere uh, on the web or on your iPhone or, or, or on your iPad. You can pick it up and, and finish where you left off later. And then you also are backing up stories to a variety of services that you may use so that you're not uh, necessarily having to go back into the iPad app later. You've got, you've got some choices. But honestly, this is reading stuff that is popular on the web, uh, articles that 
maybe someone's going to be referencing and you might as well know about it. That's why I always liked Dig in the first place. So even though it is a completely different company and, and in many ways a different product now, I think this is a great app to have, especially because it's free. Yeah, free is good. And by the way, I don't know if it's the irony is not lost in anyone else but me, but it's always it's interesting to see a Reddit article on Dig's front page. That's just <laughs> yeah. the irony is kind of painful. And also, I got to admit, for all of the stereotypes about Pinterest and who it's for, yeah, um, Pinterest has brought stuff to the table in terms of how it displays information that I'm starting to see crop up everywhere. And this new Dig has totally got a Pinterest vibe. And I don't mean this in a negative way. I think it's a really cool flow. Um, and it's probably just as simple as, hey, here's a new way of doing layout we haven't thought of for a while. Um, but this sort of multi-columned floating layout is pretty pretty cool. And this this new dig site is actually kind of kind of nice that way. I yeah. think it's good to see those guys doing good. I agree with you. I think it looks great. And yeah. it's I, I am, you know, I was a dig user before dig was even a company. I mean, it's 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 the sort of thing that I I I feel happy that it has continued even though it's yes. different it's a, yep. it's a it's a great service all right what do you got johnson all right so um this isn't gonna be real easy to show and it's super boring in terms of what it actually is people thinking oh scott's gonna show another game well i not really um i'm a big productivity proponent i believe in being organized and getting stuff done um you might even say i like getting things done which is mm -hmm. you know kind of the standard for for nerds like us and people who are sort of into that, uh, the Getting Things Done program is is kind of awesome. And there's a myriad of apps that do it. Very early on in iOS uh, app development time, there came an app called Things. And Things hit the market with a major splash. It was expensive, but it was really well liked. People really rated it highly, said it was worth the money. They had a desktop version on the Mac for 49 bucks. They had an uh, iPhone version for nine and later an iPad version for 19.99, which is still the case on all three of those prices. Um, but here's the problem. Things came, did a lot of stuff really, really, really well. And then something happened, something changed. Everybody started figuring out all these lesser apps, started figuring out, hey, one way we can beat these guys or one way we can be more relevant is to have the ability for people to sync their to-do lists, to sync their tasks, to have that happen seamlessly and be able to go anywhere and get uh, you know get their data no matter what device they're on and have it all be synced up and they had very various degrees of success some did it better than others some cost money to do that some didn't some were free and a lot of people said well things if you're going to be that expensive and not have a good syncing option it was like some crappy wi-fi method then we're not interested in you anymore and there was a bit of a backlash against things and i kind of got in that boat as well it's like well i love you things but you're not syncing and so i can't do this I need that ecosystem to work the way I need it to work. So I kind of severed my relationship with it, started using other stuff, never liked any of it as much as I liked things, but I really needed the synchronization, so I was willing to make some concessions. They were secretly, not secretly, but openly in the background working on a beta for sync for a very, very long time, way before iCloud was announced, which is mainly what some of the new guys are using is iCloud. And people started not believing them in terms of them releasing it. They were polishing it forever. It was taking a really long time. Finally, not many months ago, they released their cloud service, their syncing service uh, called Things Cloud. And it is awesome. I returned to Things to see how it worked. I don't know that I've ever seen anything more simple and easy and trustworthy than their new syncing system. So I got all that I already loved about Things and all of its simplicity and its ability to handle what I need to do and its adherence to the getting things done, you know, system of getting things done. All of that was there, plus now this really easy sync thing. And I can literally change something on this desktop I'm talking to you on right now, turn around to this Mac and check it, and it'll be up to date. Turn on my iPad and boom, it'll be on there. And my phone will be updated all at the same time without any duplication, without any glitches, without any weirdness. I've never had anything kind of go this smoothly. I wish for their sake it had been around longer. But now that it's here... It's like waiting for Christmas. It finally happened and you're thrilled to get what you got. And I'm totally back on board. I still think it's super expensive. But if you are serious about productivity with your home business or something else, and you're kind of in the Mac slash iOS ecosystem, there is no better program on the, on the market. I absolutely love things. So that gets a big fat kiss award for me today. I love that thing. Uh, so yeah, $20 if you're going to organize your life. I, I, I just paid $20 for TweetBot for Mac. <laughs> 
Mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, that's yeah. not really doing anything that I can't get for free, but it, it is worth it to me because I think it's a good product. I like the team. I mean, I feel like it's a little bit similar to what you're saying uh, with the team at Things, is that they've put together something that works for you. Uh, you can use it on multiple devices. And there's so many cloud products, and there are a lot of ways probably to do the bulk of what you need to do, that you could yep. that you could use a variety of services for free and kind of make it work. But when you have that one product that you can kind of just use for everything, um, yeah. and it helps you to get things done because we're all busy, I'm with you. I mean, $20 is, if it's the right program, it is worth it. Yeah, and it's the sync, I should mention this, is free. They don't charge you for that. So it's nice. just part of the system now. You update. And if you've been an owner of the product since day one on your iPhone or day one on your iPad, they're not going to make you pay an upgrade fee. It's just there to take and go. So ready to roll. Love it. So this is uh, Things version 2.1.1, which was Correct. updated just a couple days ago. So yep. this is the newest and the greatest things for iPad. And by the way, uh, especially when we come across apps that are a little bit more expensive and we know that you're not just going to download it unless it really appeals to you or maybe you're already familiar with, with some of the products that have come from the team in the past. If it is working for you, do let us know because it's always nice to have uh, personal accounts of how you get a certain thing done that might appeal to other people so that we can pass it along. All right, Scott, we've come to the end of our well over an hour version of iPad today. This was extremely fun. Thank you so much for joining me. Um, and for anybody who's following the Frog Pants Network, your, your, your cool illustrations, if they're following you on Twitter, everything that you're doing because you're an extremely busy person, what's new and cool in the world of Scott Johnson? Oh, man, there's so much going on, and there's so many things I could mention. Um, we're doing a live taping of the newest show to the network tonight called Comic Dorks. It's myself. Uh, it's the artist and writer uh, behind the long-beloved webcomic series uh, PVP by Scott Kurtz. Scott Kurtz is there. Uh, uh, Major Spoiler Zone, Steven Schleicher is there. Mark Spagnola from The Wood Whisper. We get together, we talk comic books once a month, and I'm super stoked about episode two, which we do tonight. But I think, moreover, uh, aside from just pointing people to frogpants.com where they can find everything I've got going on, I highly recommend if you have a boring morning at work or you're on some crummy commute in the morning and you need something to listen to, uh, tune into our morning show, The Morning Stream, which airs Monday through Thursday every week on the Frog Pants Network. You can find that at frogpants.com slash TMS. And for everything else, just uh, follow me on Twitter. I'm at Scott Johnson. It's that simple. All and right. thanks, Sarah. It was a blast. I absolutely love hanging out with you. Thanks so much. And I really hope you lose the winter movie draft. Oh! <laughs> well, we'll see. I've got I've got a little vampire movie that might get me out of the doldrums because Lord knows I did not start off strong. I really thought that Seven Psychopaths was going <laughs> to do well, and it was more than disappointing. I don't even want to talk about it. Scott and I are both in a in a uh, fantasy movie league, and yep. if you're not familiar with that, you should go watch a. Like, what three weeks ago we we did it live on an episode of Frame Rate. If you want Frame to follow rate, right. along, it's it's actually very entertaining. I, I love doing the draft, but Scott and I are enemies because yeah. of that. Um, but oh, when you all need to go out and see Skyfall, not that you weren't going to, but that I just recommend, uh, not for any reason for the movie draft. I think people should just go see Skyfall. That's, well, really, I'm see, lying. I want I you feel, to go. That's yeah. how I feel about Red Dawn. I really think it's going to be just <laughs> one of the best remakes ever. So, you know, the fact that I have it in my movie draft is really neither here nor there. But uh, Red Dawn would definitely be my pick. And, of course, if you like Twilight, that'll just put a little money in, in my pocket, too. But it, Oof, anyway... Listen, I forgot you have that. Dang I've it. got Twilight, but Tom's got The Hobbit. So, anyway, this is all very complicated. Right mm. now, Father Robert's beating us all with Hotel Transylvania. But... Anyway, um, yeah. thank you so he much. All the, he, he got all the animated stuff. He, he really, we're all dead. I He's going to get us. It's, it's, it's not good. You know, I got really <laughs> cocky because I won one time and I thought that I had the formula and it's like, now I can't win. But, no. uh, but anyway, thanks so much for being part of iPad today. Come back again soon because it's great to have another iOS lover in the mix. Um, and thanks to everybody for watching. Leo will be back next week uh, on Thursday, 1 p.m. Pacific, 4 p.m. Eastern. And we'll see you then.